Yes, I am very much concerned about our human uh, attitude of superiority in relation to other creatures, other living creatures. Our insistence that we have a sort of superior um, take on life and the other animals are as much part of our continuum, we are part of that continuum and I think there is a great need for us to accept that we are animals ourselves, that there's a kinship between us and that um, we need to take seriously the role of stewardship in relation to our environment. Yeah, this exhibition is, is a very large body of work which took me about three years in the making, pretty much over the lockdown period, the COVID lockdown period. Um, it's it's quite a quite a, an effort to make an exhibition or to put together an exhibition with the kind of work that I do, which is very slow in the making. It's craft based, it's handmade, so clearly it takes a lot of time. Okay, craft based work is very meditative work. It's it's it sort of involves the mind and the hand working in tandem, and um, I've. I called this exhibition Armour and Lace. Okay. The armour is um, really made by way of a coiling process of weaving, which is a bit like basket weaving. And you can see it's quite a rigid form. On the other extreme, I work with a much finer wire to create the lace work, uh, which involves much more open-ended uh, looping of wire, so that one gets something that's much more pliable, permeable um, than, the, than the armor. I've chosen to also include the word the, a bestiary in my title as a kind of framing device for the exhibition. Um, a lot of the works deal with human, animal and uh, plant uh, dynamics or power relations. And the bestiary is as old as humanity. It is basically an encyclopedia of animals, mostly animals, also plants, um, that is used as a, as a kind of um, moral instruction. So stories told about animals in relation to human strengths and weaknesses. In the Middle Ages, the bestiary became a very popular form of book illustration. So the monks in the monasteries used to illustrate or copy texts and illustrate them with small images, very colorful images. And um, we often refer to this as man manuscript illumination. Illumination comes from the Latin word illuminare, which means to light up or to lighten up. And uh, the monks quite often used uh, materials like uh, gold foil and silver foil to literally light up the images. And I quite liked that idea of lighting up um, as something that I wanted to do in this exhibition. So a lot of the works are metallic, um, aluminium. I work mostly in aluminium. But they have also been anodized. And anodizing is a process of creating a coat of color over the um, aluminum. It's basically a process whereby the aluminum is dipped into a chemical bath with electrodes uh, sending a current through the wire whilst it is in the bath and that deposits a very thin film of gold or whatever color one wants on the surface. I really wanted to create quite a magical space with these illuminated forms and uh, something that would have some, some sort of sense of reverence about it. In this work, which I titled Sun Gazers, I have three lizards um, arranged in an install, in, in the wall installation. Again, the lizards in their typical um, uh, sort of basking in the sun mode. Um, I think what I also wanted to achieve here was a bit of uncertainty or ambiguity about whether these creatures might 
re be reactivated or whether this is a sort of onset of a longer waiting or a sort of longer stasis. Um, I, 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 did, I added the lace or the netting around these animals as a, as a suggestion of the, the warmth from the sun, the kind of radiating of the warmth. Um, and I also used a bit of bitumen paint over the gold anodizing to accentuate the scaliness of the creatures and um, also to unify the three animals as a group. Uh, this is a close-up portrait drawing of, the sun, of a sun gazer lizard. I called it uh, Smog Gigantius, which is the scientific name given to this animal. And it actually comes from, the smog comes from uh, Tolkien's uh, book, The Hobbit, uh, the dragon that features in that book. Um, and I tried to depict it as a huge colossus, almost like a mountain. Uh, made up of rocks, um, something almost uh, sphinx-like in character. It, it sort of looks down towards us, down upon us. Um, in a way, a kind of monument, monumentalizing of, of the creature. I, I, I proceeded with this drawing by first um, putting a layer of black oil paint on the paper, um, after which I then glued the gold leaf in little blocks over the entire surface. And then I, I took a blade to the gold leaf and scraped away a lot of the, what is exposed as black or dark inside the head. And then after that, I also used an oil, a black oil stick and oil uh, crayon to um, model the forms inside, inside the head. I wanted to create something that would almost look a bit petrified, something that has a, that kind of geological feel about it. Okay, this work is called Sun Dewa, and I took the idea from a carnivorous plant uh, called the Sun Dew plant. Um, Drosera is also the name given, scientific name given to it, uh, which features a, a lot of tiny tentacles with um, mucus glands attached to its end. So it secretes this very sticky fluid, which in the sunlight, I suppose, creates a kind of dew-like effect, that's the sun dew. And um, when an insect comes along and touches the plant, it gets hooked onto the sticky mucus, and the more it struggles, the more it gets covered in mucus. And eventually the plant can even envelop the animal and it literally digests it. I like the idea of the plant behaving like an animal. It, it kind of behaves very contrary to what we expect from the kindly plant kingdom. And uh, a kind of mergence between species occurs in this instance. Uh, the name sun appears quite often in these works. We have the sun gazers, the sun dewer, and in this very large network here, we also have the sun occupying the center of this work. Um, this piece took a very long time to make because it involved initially weaving the sun itself and then proceeding to individually weave the insects that are depicted as scattering away from the sun and then stitching it all together and right at the end also adding all these little cocoon shapes to create a very full picture. I call this piece uh, spread. Um, we know the name spread from things like the bed spread, in other words a kind of covering, a textile covering, but clearly it also references spread as in dispersal, so a kind of image of scattering of animals flying away from the sun in the middle. It might recall uh, the uh, story, the Greek story of Pandora, who was given a box by her husband Zeus and told never to open it, but um, she got inquisitive and opened it and all the ills of humanity escaped. So that idea of if something is um, 
activated, it can actually become something quite unmanageable in the future. Okay, this, this work is called Amber, Amber Flower. Um, lace is a, a somewhat ambiguous construction in that it, it both um, reveals and conceals. It's made up of, or sort of weaves together holes and thread. There's something quite ambiguous about the absence and presence coming together. Um, I found an image of a flower caught in amber. Um, and I'd, I read a description recently where someone described amber as uh, a window into the past. Uh, the little flower caught millions of years ago in the amber can still be seen today. And I really liked that idea of the time capsule, um, which also relates somewhat to the time taken in making the image, a kind of layering of, of netted uh, weaving to achieve the final image. I also added quite a few little um, uh, golden beads to the surface to enrich it, and also, again, used a bit of bitumen paint to model the form. But it, for me, it creates almost like a, a rose window to the exhibition, a sort of central floral feature. Uh, this work I titled uh, Carapax Zygen in brackets. The Zygen refers to Zygentoma, the scientific name given to the fish moth. Um, it looks a bit like a medieval suit of armor. In fact, I did base a lot of this detail on a representation of a battle armor. And um, I've basically revisited an old work that I made in 1997 of a fish moth. Um, which was also quite large, about three meters tall, with these large extended antennae. And what I've done here is to clearly make the central body of the fish moth a much more recognizable armor or a body shell. And I've quite often used this idea of the body shell as something that the viewer can identify with physically. So you can literally in Imagine yourself being inside of that bodysuit looking out. As it were, a kind of identification with the creature, with the fish moth or whatever the creature is. Um, and also imagining the, the kind of sensual communication of these antennae with its surrounding environment. So much more of a body, body embodied um, response to the outside world. I anodized it in bright silver so that it would really shine, um, a bit like a knight in shining armor version of the carapace. This is a second uh, carapax bodysuit work with, on this exhibition, uh, which I've titled Carapax Darkling in brackets. Um, Darkling refers to a black beetle um, and I found an image of a black beetle with little orange hairs sticking out behind its carapax sections. And I thought it would be interesting to interpret those little hairs with copper wire. So these are all little tufts of copper wire which are pushed through the weave to create a much more bristly um, contrast to the very dark uh, suit. Uh, the suit was anodized in black. Uh, which I then also spray painted over to create a much, much denser black. And then I also introduced uh, some glass beads to further uh, give, the, uh, give more of a sparkle to the figure itself. It's quite a sinister looking suit, also in the way that it is almost glued against the wall or sort of hovers against the wall with the head slightly tilted forwards. Okay, this red drawing is called Plexus. Um, it's made uh, with a fountain pen and permanent red ink. Uh, Plexus refers to a collection of fibers, of nerve fibers or blood vessels. And um, in this instance, I've created a suit of armor that looks as if 
blood vessels are emanating from it. Or it might even remind one of a kind of embryonic uh, figure developing in an egg, for example, a kind of hatching creature. We don't normally associate the hard exoskeleton of an armor with something living, but in this case, I've sort of flipped the inside-outside relationship. So there's a sense of the armor being a living thing, something that can reach out into the environment. Um, I based it on a drawing that I made several years ago in 2007, um, which was a representation of the arterial complex of the human body. I drew it on a scale of an adult figure, and it was uh, uh, taken from a medical illustration, which I then further exaggerated, so the blood vessels um, almost become like a furry extension of the arterial complex. So it, it kind of presents the human body without its armor or without its uh, barrier between uh, the body and the outside world, a, a sort of permeable um, figure. Um, I like the idea also of blood. Blood is something that we as humans share with animals, or let's say that it is a medium that both animals and humans share. And it is also something that brings the outside into us. So blood carries oxygen and nutrients and also viruses into our body. And we all also know that blood is something that spills. It doesn't respect borders. It's something that spills across borders. In this series of drawings, um, I tried to do something in relation to the notion of classification of insects. Uh, scientific taxonomies or classifications of insects are quite detached and objective. They focus on the similarities and differences in structure between animals. And what I thought I would do in this series was to rather foreground the capacities and powers of these creatures to uh, defend themselves against predators. So it's a bit, it's a bit like a little uh, costume parade of uh, defense strategies. So you have some creatures that are quite moth-like, um, where the coloration, the conspicuous color, might be something that they use to startle the predator with or it might tell the predator, be careful, I'm poisonous. Or the, um, in this work, the spinous extensions might remind one of a caterpillar. Again, a kind of warding off signal. Or the moth in these instances um, have uh, false eyes that might say to the predator, be careful, I might be an owl or something dangerous to attack. Okay, these are my romper suits, or I call them rompers. A romper is a body suit from head to toe, uh, but it also refers to a boisterous, um, playful character, a romper. Um, the uh, sort of signaling between species is not always about defensive um, actions. It can also be a kind of signaling to each other, to attract each other. And I sort of created a, a playful series of, of rompers, little insect-like creatures, humanoid insect-like creatures, with their own um, bioluminescence. So they look a little bit like glowworms and creatures that are able to create their own light. Some of them might also look a little bit like they are pollinators of some sort. Uh, this little uh, work um, might seem a little bit odd in relation to the other works. Um, it's a flower arrangement. It is based on a work by Odilon Redon, whose works I really admire. Um, some of his dark charcoal drawings um, of heads and floating eyes 
But on the other hand, he also paints very colorful floral paintings and um, pastel studies. It was my first attempt at uh, watercolor monoprinting and I really wanted to, I'm not really known for working in color a lot, but I really wanted to explore the, um, the range of colors uh, at my disposal. I, so I based it on the image of Redong um, and then I also introduced the little local locust on the vase as a kind of uh, motif that I often use. Yeah, the pangolin is, again, as I've mentioned before, one of the most endangered, it is in fact, I think, the world's most endangered mammal. Um, we all know that it, when it is um, a, a attacked, that it rolls up into a ball to cover itself um, from the predator. Uh, it has its very, it's completely covered in scales, which it can also use to attack a predator. But it is a very, very um, endearing animal. A very, it doesn't harm anybody. It's, it's a solitary creature that wanders long distances to find uh, ants to feed on. It is mostly nocturnal. Um, I've always loved this image of this very quiet animal, and I've depicted it in this work, which I've titled Urn, as something perched on top of a, a stopper to a container. I mean, an urn is something that we associate with containment of ashes of the deceased. So, in a way, it is my form of memorializing this animal, which is soon not to be. Twenty years from now, we may not have any more of these animals. Uh, this little piece is called Rover, again referring to the, the wandering pangolin. Um, and I've also uh, done a little drawing in this uh, work called Trace of a Pangolin Skeleton as a kind of remainder of the animal. Yes, I'd like, I, I hope that uh, people who visit the exhibition, they will be enchanted by the works. I think the works do have an, a, an element of beauty about them, something that attracts, I think beauty is something that is often quite underrated in contemporary art. It has become a kind of something not to include in art making, as if it is something that covers up the important parts of, um, of the world. In fact, um, Elaine Scarry has said that beauty is something that um, stops us in our tracks, it uh, transfixes us, and it makes us look away from our self-centered point of view to things outside of ourselves, to other people, other things. So it is a very important tool, I think. It makes us uh, feel something. And I think, I'm, I'm hoping that the works also make people feel something. A lot of the works do invite the viewer to imagine him or herself being that animal, stepping inside of the body of another creature. or. Um, I think also the works being handcrafted also have an element of tactility about them, so there's a kind of sensuousness beyond just the visual, which I've tried to highlight in these works.